for your grace, for your mercy, and thank you for the wonderful plan of salvation. And not only the plan, but the working out of the plan from eternity past to eternity future. And in time, bringing Jesus to earth, sending him to earth, and then sending him to the cross publicly that he might be the satisfaction of your wrath toward our sin. That for everyone who will trust in him, they will receive eternal life. And Lord, you will bring us to yourself. And we thank you that Jesus went to the cross to bring us to God, to reconcile us to you. Father, today as we look in your word, we will look at a creature whom you will not reconcile to yourself. We will look at those whom you have chosen not to redeem. We will look at this one whom you created in perfection, who chose to rebel against you. And Father, who continues to rebel and lead people in rebellion against you. And yet, Father, we thank you that we who have been part of that and who were rebels to you and rebels to your cause have been redeemed by the blood, the rescue of Christ at the cross. We pray that we, as we hear your word today, as we take these songs that we have sung to you and we listen to these words as the Spirit of God works in our hearts today, that we will look at our world, Father, as our mission field, as our opportunity, while we are still alive, to share the rescue of Christ with those who do not yet know him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. You know, um, I appreciate Jack mentioning all the other people that, that watch our services, and I don't know if you realize this or not, but many of the people that I work with, and Nancy and I work with overseas in places like Myanmar and Africa, a um, few other places that, that can't even be mentioned here publicly, um, are actually watching the services every week. And they, they are listening to the singing, they're listening to the Word of God and the Sermons are being used in the school, and uh, they, they, they get to watch this, and they enjoy this. The, the questions they have, however, is how can Americans survive on such short church services when they in their country come for miles, usually walking or whatever they have to do, and once they arrive, it's all day because that's what they will survive on the rest of the week. So they just want to know, how does it work in your country that you just come and it's, it's rushed and you've got to move so fast and get out? And, and I said, I don't know. I don't know. Um, they've noticed the comfortable chairs. <laughs> uh, they've enjoyed the worship. The songs, of course, are different. Those that know English have understood the, the lyrics. Everything is, is usually translated. But, but what's happening here is, is actually being seen in other places. So pray for others around the world who actually are watching us. Um, and one day it would be cool for us to be able to watch them, I think, as well. You know, if Satan has a favorite poem, I would have to wager that William Henley's poem entitled Invictus, which was published in 1888, would be the top runner. In fact, Invictus, which simply means unconquerable soul, really sums up Satan's whole vision statement, especially the last stanza of the poem, which goes like this, and you probably know that, this last stanza. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Henley's poem was a literary attack against the scriptural truth that all creatures are responsible and accountable to a sovereign creator God. And in fact, this creator God will one day judge all creatures and their life decisions and subsequent actions. And Henley could not handle that truth. So in his mind, he was the master of his fate. He was the captain of his soul. It was really his declaration of independence from God as he makes that point that it's he, not God, who is in charge. 
And this is exactly what Satan believed and has been telling people ever since Genesis chapter 3 when he convinced Eve and her husband Adam that they did not need God and in fact were better off without God. And following up on last week's study about the identity of the serpent in the garden in Genesis 3, this week we're going to look at what the Bible teaches about the origin and the rebellion of Satan. So go with me to Genesis chapter 3. We'll start there. We're going to be in Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14 this morning. But let's start here in Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Follow along as I read. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Let's read verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and she ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Now last week we looked at those verses and we saw Satan making three deceptive statements in those verses which worked because he deceived Eve, and then she then went to her husband, who was really right there with her. She kind of looked over her shoulder probably at him, and he nodded his head and said, I'm good, let's go for it. And they were deceived, and they ate the forbidden fruit, and they fell because of their disobedience. But it was more than just eating forbidden fruit, because what Satan's deception really was, was the deception of saying to Adam and Eve, and to all of us, because we've all fallen for it, is that God really doesn't know what he's doing. And that God's instructions really are optional. They're kind of suggestions. Because God really does not know what's best for you, and God really is holding out on you. And if you really want to be happy, if you really want an exciting life, if you really want satisfaction... You are responsible for your own happiness. You're responsible for your own satisfaction. You've got to take life by the horns, and you've got to make it what it's going to be. You've got to live for every moment. You've got to drain everything out of it, and you are in charge. You've got to believe in yourself. Oh, haven't we heard that a lot? And that's Satan's lie. And Adam and Eve fell for it. Because really the essence of the lie is this. You can live life independent of God. And there's no negative consequences for that. That's what his lie was. You will not die. Listen, disobey, sin, go your own way. You're the captain of your own ship. And there's no consequences for that. Adam and Eve fell for it. Every one of us has fallen for it. Everyone has. And so Satan deceives man in the garden. The interesting thing about this is the very deception that he was deceived by too. But he was his own deceiver. Now it's interesting that last week we identified the serpent in the garden as Satan. We're not going to go back over that. If you didn't hear that, you just have to listen to that message from last week. We spent a lot of time doing that. And the interesting thing about it is that nowhere in Genesis 3 do we see Satan entering the Garden of Eden. Rather, we see that he's already there. And and, and that is really important because it's almost as though he is supposed to be there. And in fact, Adam nor Eve are surprised at all that he's there. There's no surprise in Genesis 3 that Satan is in the Garden of Eden. We we see Satan tempting Eve, who then, in turn, as I said, tempts her husband. They sin. They bring the whole human race into sin. They bring a curse and corruption upon the whole creation. 
And, and whereas we know where Adam and Eve came from and where the rest of the creation came from, where did Satan come from? Well, fortunately, the Bible doesn't leave us hanging. It takes us behind the scenes, behind the curtain, and it gives us insights and information into the origin of Satan. And there's two main passages that we're going to look at this morning, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. And both of these passages begin by talking about two very evil, very influential, very powerful kings and their kingdoms upon the earth, the kingdom of Babylon and the kingdom of Tyre. But both of these passages, once they describe these two human kings and kingdoms, then go deeper behind the scenes and they begin to describe the source and the primary influence of evil behind these two human leaders and behind their political rule. And this is where Jesus' words help us out. Because Jesus, in talking about Satan, in John chapter 12, verse 31, in John chapter 14, verse 30, and John chapter 16, verse 11, calls Satan the ruler of this world. So last week I told you that Satan is the ruler of this world. The reason we say that is because that's what Jesus called him. And there's a reason for that. So again, in those passages, if you want to look them up later, John 12, 31, John 14, 30, and John 16, 11, Jesus calls Satan the ruler of this world. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the apostle Paul refers to Satan as the god of this world using a little g. So the Bible is saying Satan is the ruler, uh, excuse me, <laughs> the ruler of this world system, and he's the god of this world system. Not God as in who God is, but a little g. He thinks he's God. And all this is why Satan says what he says in Luke 4, verses 5 through 6, when he is trying to tempt Jesus. Here's what he said in Luke 4, 5, and 6. And the devil took him, Jesus, up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Remember that after Jesus was baptized, the Spirit took him into the wilderness, and he was tempted by Satan. And we have three of those recorded temptations, but there were many, many, many more. He was tempted over the course of 40 days and 40 nights in which he was fasting. This is one of them. So Satan takes him up. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world in one moment of time. And Satan said to Jesus, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. Now understand, this is Satan talking to God the Son. And he's telling God the Son, I have the right to give you authority over earth, not the other way around. And Jesus does not correct him. Jesus does not rebuke him. Jesus listens to him, and here's Jesus' reply. Jesus answered, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. In other words, in answer to Satan's demand that he would give him authority over the earth if he would just worship Satan, Jesus says, no, I won't worship you. You see, Jesus was going to take that authority back. But it was going to require the cross to do that. He was going to take the authority over earth back. He was going to take control back. But he would go through the cross in order to do that. That's what would be required. But the fact is, Satan did have rightful authority at this point in time from Genesis 3 until God finally brings him to his end over the kingdoms of the earth. That's staggering to us. We don't understand that. The word delivered, where Satan says, to you I'll give all this authority, for it has been delivered to me. The word that he used is paradidomai in Greek. It means surrendered. He says, the authority over earth was surrendered to me. Who surrendered the authority over the earth to Satan? 
It was Adam and Eve. When they chose to disobey God in the garden, they surrendered authority that God had given them to be his regents and his king and his queen over the earth. And they gave it to him. And that's what sin does. Sin always surrenders something. It always gives up more than you ever imagined would be required of you. It always costs more than we ever think, doesn't it? Have any of us ever really gained because of sin? Or have we lost more than we ever imagined could be lost? Well, Adam and Eve, and we by extension, lost authority over the kingdoms of the earth. We'll talk more about what that means, but there's another thing to notice here. Jesus actually believes in and teaches the existence of Satan as a real living being. Don't miss that, because many do. Jesus actually believes in the existence of a real Satan. Now, that's significant, especially in light of the fact that according to one of the most recent Barna polls of professing Christians who took the poll, who attend church in the United States, 59% don't believe Satan is a real living being, but merely a symbol of evil. Now, that's 59% of people who are saying they're born-again Christians who actively attend church on a regular basis, who were polled, Almost 60% say, we don't believe Satan's real. It's just a symbol of of evil. So so how do almost 60% of professing Christians believe that Jesus is God, knows all things, and is without sin, but also believe he's mistaken or lying about the existence of Satan? That makes no sense at all, does it? How can you say on, on one hand, yes, I believe in God, I believe the Bible's true about God. I believe that he's sinless. I believe that Jesus is the Savior. I believe that he could not have sinned. He could not be mistaken about anything because he's omniscient. But you know, Jesus is making a mistake here when he's talking about Satan being real. What's that to say about those people's profession of faith and the authenticity of that profession of faith? What's it to say, what's it say about the Bible teaching that goes on in many churches today? See, there's a problem within the American church. And and, and that problem is we're not believing our faith, and in fact, we're not believing our faith because we really don't even know what it is in many respects, because we are not in this book. We're not in the Word of God much anymore. The Word of God isn't preached much anymore. And and when it is preached, oftentimes it does have to be rushed. And oftentimes it's it's just a little scratching on the surface that we get, and we rarely go deep anymore. And it shows up in everything we think, everything we believe, everything we do. But Jesus believes in the reality of Satan. So, I didn't want you to miss that. The Bible is saying Satan is real. Okay, so back to Satan usurping Adam and thus man's authority over the earth. Ever since Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve surrendered their rightful place as God's appointed regents over the earth, Satan has functioned as the ruler of the world system. The Greek word for that is cosmos. Cosmos. That's where we get our word for world as well, cosmos. In Greek, it's talking about a world system, a way of thinking, a way of ordering priorities, a philosophy of life. It's talking about a worldview. And Satan has functioned as the ruler of this world system so that he is the evil influence behind everything in culture, in politics, in government, in education, in entertainment, and false religion that opposes the word of God. That's what it means when the Bible is saying he is the ruler of this world, he is the God of this world. 
He is behind everything that is opposing God's program, God's plan, and God's word. And he is in every realm of society, including education. And really, when you look at Genesis 3, the big thing that grabs Eve, which then grabs Adam, which grabbed Satan, is when they saw that the fruit was desirable to make them wise. And what that means is give them more knowledge. And in Satan's words, he wanted God's knowledge. But he wanted God's knowledge without God. Listen, knowledge without God produces what we see going on in many cities in the United States right now. Listen, education without God is not education. Because when you say, we don't want the creator involved in education, well then, how do you study the creation without the creator? That means all the knowledge is inferior and it's going to lead you the wrong way and it's going to lead you to the wrong conclusions. It makes no sense at all. And yet we've bought into that, haven't we? Knowledge is power. No, knowledge is not power. Knowledge is a curse without God. Satan wanted God's knowledge. He wanted the information that God had. Because he believed that if he had that knowledge, he could be God and he could manipulate that knowledge to make himself greater than God. And that's what he fed Adam and Eve. And that's what he feeds us. You just need knowledge. You don't need God. No. Knowledge without God is a curse. It leads you to wrong conclusions and to wrong destinations. And we see that throughout the Word of God. So, Ezekiel 28, let's go there. Let's see how this all happened in the time remaining. What happened? What went on in Satan's life? Who was he? Where did God want him to be? What kind of plan did God have for him in the first place? Ezekiel 28, in in verses 1 through 10... It's a lament about this evil human king of Tyre and the kingdom. But then in verses 11 through 19, the Bible takes us behind the king, behind the kingdom, so that we can see the actual evil influence and power behind this wicked earthly king and kingdom who is none other than Satan himself. And as I said last week, Satan's influence is behind every earthly kingdom, including our own. We are not immune to Satan's influence. And we see that. Here God is just picking two kingdoms and giving us a glimpse. So let's look at Ezekiel 28. Look at verse 12. Here's where everything begins to change. He's talking in human terms through 1 through 11. And then the Bible begins to take us into a scene that is obviously not what's going on in that present time of Ezekiel 28. He says in verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. And now he's talking about the power behind this king. He says, You had the seal of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. That's how we know he's taken us back in time now. Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the laps, the the lazuli, the turquoise, the emerald, the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you on the day that you were created. They were prepared. You, verse 14, were the anointed cherub who covers or who guards. In the NIV, it's the guardian cherub. And I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub or guardian cherub. 
from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. That is Satan that the Bible is talking about here. So in verse 12, the Bible says Satan was perfect and really the model of perfection. He was full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Verse 13, the Bible tells us that even before Genesis 3, Satan was in Eden. He was in the Garden of Eden. Somewhere between God finishing the creation, or actually before he creates man, and he's working on the Garden of Eden, he places Satan in that garden. We don't know how long Adam and Eve were actually in the garden before they sinned. We don't know how long they were there before Adam. Satan fell, but we know the Bible says that Satan was stationed in Eden, the garden of God. And then verse 13 talks about his covering. It's it's actually a breastplate. Uh, In verse 13 it says that he has this breastplate, this covering. It's made up of precious stones. It was given to him on the day that he was created. And the reason it was given to him on the day he was created, it was to designate his office or his position that God was giving him. And the interesting thing about this breastplate is that it bears a striking, remarkable resemblance to the breastplates which God commanded the high priests of Israel to wear in Exodus chapter 28 and Exodus 39 when they were leading the people of God in worship of God. It's almost the same breastplate. So why is Satan wearing this breastplate, which marks his position, that looks like the breastplate that was worn later by the high priest of Israel? Well, verse 14 helps us because it tells us that Satan was originally the anointed cherub. Again, if you've got the NIV, it's rendered the guardian cherub. So what does that mean? What does it mean that he's the anointed cherub or the guardian cherub? Well, it means that Satan was an angel. He was an angel that belonged to the unique and really the most powerful and the highest class of angels that God had created, known as the cherubim. In Hebrew, it's kerub. In fact, cherubim, rightly pronounced, is cherubim. But we say it, we've said it like cherubim so long that everybody thinks I'm saying it wrong if I say it the right way, so we'll just say it the wrong way. And the phrase the cherub who covers, or the cherub who guards. Thus the guardian cherub is talking about Satan's role as the leader of the cherubim, the most powerful angel ever created, who was given the responsibility to guard God's glory in the sense that he was to ensure that other creatures, namely Newly created human beings would know how to approach and worship the glorious God of the universe. In fact, many Bible scholars believe that before his fall, Satan led angelic worship in heaven and was placed by God in the Garden of Eden to teach and to lead Adam and Eve and their descendants and how to rightly worship God so that God's glory was not diminished in any way by human attempts to worship God. John MacArthur makes this point. He says, The anointed cherub was heaven's praise leader, heaven's worship leader, and in fact the highest angel in charge of all praise to the glorious God. James Montgomery Boyce writes that before his sin, Satan was to direct the worship and the obedience of all created beings back to God in a way that honored the glory of God. And and I think that's why we see Satan already in the garden in Genesis 3, because before his fall, God assigned him there. And, And as the anointed cherub, the guardian cherub, whose job it was to protect the glory of God and the integrity of who God is when worshiped, that he was there have something to do with human beings and the worship of God. 
Ezekiel 28, 13 says of Satan, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Ezekiel 28, 14 makes the point again. The garden of Eden is where God stationed Satan before he fell. But you also see, when you look at the rest of Ezekiel 28, 14, that Satan had access to heaven where he still has access to God. But then everything changed in verse 15 of Ezekiel 28, because that's when unrighteousness was found in Satan. And according to the verses we read, verses 16 through 17, the gist of Satan's righteousness was his pride. So Satan's sin was pride. He fell because of pride. Once Satan began to be infatuated by his own splendor and his own glory, and he gave himself to pride, he then sought to violently usurp the place and the authority of God by leading a rebellion of other proud angels against God. And you see this in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6, where the Bible tells us that when Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him. That is a massive force of angelic power that has now fallen from righteousness. And it is these former angels who are demons today. And Satan is the head of that demonic class of fallen angels. It's hidden to a large degree in our country and in the West. You just need to step out of this country and go to countries in the third world where the gospel has not penetrated, where the gospel is not established, and you can see it very clearly. In territory that Satan has held for centuries, the worship of demons and Satan and satanic influences and power is evident. You, you, you can't miss it. You feel it. You sense it. You deal with it. But in our country and in the West, Satan has used another tactic, and, and that tactic is to disguise it, make it look good. He's had great success in the educational realm, wonderful success in the political realm, and the entertainment realm, well, that was just... That was his place. He would be the great entertainer, the great deceiver. He didn't have to come across as evil to fool us. He just remained the angel of light. And so now things are beginning to change a little bit, though, aren't they? He's, he's realizing that the foothold that he has is, is a little stronger than he might have had, and so it's okay to start to reveal himself in ways that perhaps we're not used to seeing, but we are going to see, and we better get used to seeing them, who he really is, the enemy of God, the enemy of God's people. From the time Satan fell, there's never been in him one single solitary good Impulse. He is evil, and in fact, he is unredeemably evil. Thinking that he could be like, and in fact, better than God, he became utterly unlike God. His pride made him as unlike God as possible, and so does our pride. Our pride makes us like Satan, not like God, and that's why God hates pride. Listen, we are never more unlike God and more like the devil when we are acting out of pride and arrogance. So, so that's Ezekiel's description of Satan, which gives us the general reason why he fell. It was because of his pride. And now, very briefly, look at Isaiah 14 and look specifically at what he said and how he worked out his pride before God. Look at Isaiah 14. Again, in Isaiah 14, we're talking about a human king, and then the Bible switches, takes us behind the scene to the power behind this human king in verses 12 through 15. 
and we start to see that we are talking about Satan. The Bible is talking about Satan. So in Isaiah chapter 14, and we'll start here in verse 12. The Bible addresses him. It says, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, sun of the dawn. It's the Hebrew word Hillel, one of the words in that title. It's the bright, shining one. This, this whole name was, was translated into Latin as Lucifer. And so that's why some of your Bibles may actually have Lucifer right there. It was one of the names of Satan. So he says, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, sun of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth. You who have weakened the nations. There it is. There's his control, his power, his influence over the political systems of the earth. But you said in your heart, and here's what Satan said, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. The stars of God is a reference to angels. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high God. The word, the name he uses for God is El Elyon. El Elyon is the possessor of heaven and earth. And so what Satan is saying, I will possess heaven and I will possess earth. And then God says, nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol to the recesses of the pit. God does not lose the fights he gets in. And he announces the doom of Satan here. But God has purposes in mind that he uses Satan for in bringing about history, bringing about his predetermined end to history. None of this happened apart from God's omniscience, all-knowing, or God's sovereign power. None of it. And as you study the Bible, you see that Satan is really nothing more than a tool that God uses to bring about his purposes for good, which greatly frustrates Satan in ways you could never imagine. You see something else in these verses, however, that's hiding in the shadows something that's lurking deep within Satan. It's something that that we might be tempted to think is, is not nearly as bad as pride, especially when we see it in ourselves. Because there's something in here that we see in ourselves if we're honest with ourselves. And it's bad. It's really bad. Because just as in Satan's case, it both fed and was a manifestation of his pride. And in us, it both feeds and manifests our pride. And the thing that you don't really see here, it's hidden underneath, is discontentment. Discontentment. Which is basically being dissatisfied with God. You know how we see that in church? Here's how we see that in church when we become dissatisfied with the Bible and we turn our attention to every other book under the sun, every other video series, church is getting a little boring. Let's just bring videos in. You see, we we get tired of this and we want the novel. We want that which is exciting and that which is new and that which promises to finally give us the answers. And God says, I gave you the answer. It's right here. See, we've lost the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture. That it really is sufficient, as God says it is, for what we need. But we want to continually replace it at every hand, it seems. So that's how it plays out in the church. We are dissatisfied. We want that which is more novel, that which is more relevant, that which is more cutting-edge than Scripture. 
It shows up when we're dissatisfied with God's plan for our life, God's provisions, God's place, the position that he's given us. Believing that we deserve better than God is giving or doing for us. And see, Satan was not content with God's plan. He was not content with God's place. He was not content with God's position for him. He didn't believe God had given him what was best. He wanted more power, more influence, more prestige, more recognition, more opportunity, more control, more knowledge, more freedom. And in his desire for more, he became less. His discontentment with God's best for him and his pride, which caused him to think he could change God's best for him, led him to rebel against God so as to declare his independence from God and God's kind and gracious rule over his life. And in doing so, he lost everything as well as guaranteed his future eternal punishment in the pit of hell. And that's what Isaiah 14, 15 is saying, where God says you're going to go to the pit. So, so Satan's sins of pride and discontentment led to unbelief in God's goodness, led to unbelief in God's good plan for him, which then led to ungodly personal ambitions, which then led to rebellion against God. So pride, discontentment, unbelief, ungodly ambition, and rebellion are all hellish sins, especially when they're working together, which they almost always do. But the real tragic thing is that the lie these sins spawned in Satan, the lie that he deceived himself with, that he could become like God so as to be independent of God and change his circumstances so as to create a better life and happiness for himself than God could is the same lie that he deceived Adam and Eve with. And it's the same lie he deceives us with too, isn't it? It's the same lie. The lie didn't work for him, and yet he's deceiving millions with it, billions with it that you can become like God and in fact live independent of God so as to be the master of your own life, so as to live life without God, so as to sin at will and not experience the consequences of that sin. You know, I think that if William Henley were to pen his poem Invictus today, a little over 100 years since he died and went to his eternal reward, he would definitely change the poem to say this in the last stanza. It really does matter how straight the gate how charged with punishments the scroll, because we are not the masters of our fate or the captains of our souls. You see, Satan believed he could shove his fists in God's face and not have consequences to face. So did Adam and Eve. And so do you and I every time we are driven by discontentment, dissatisfaction, pride, and selfish ambition to choose to rebel and sin against God. But, Thanks be to God that as God's people, and we, we fall prey to this even as God's people. Every time we sin, we do. We can repent of our sins, and we can be restored to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because John 1, 9 says what? If we what? Confess our sins, he is just and righteous to what? Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you're an unbeliever, you can be forgiven. You can be reconciled and you can be saved from the same eternal banishment that Satan is going to experience in hell if you will just come to Christ by faith, believing and trusting in him to save you from your sins. As you trust in his finished work that he accomplished on Calvary so as to rescue you from this lie. And for all of us who have come to Christ for salvation, the last stanza of Henley's poem was actually revised by a woman named Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day was an anarchist. She was an activist, a communist revolutionary, who after being redeemed by Christ several years ago wrote this, I have no fear, though straight the gate, he cleared from punishment the scroll because Christ is the master of my fate and he is the captain of my soul. Can you say this with confidence? I hope so. I hope so. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. 
Father, you don't give us the story of Satan just to amuse us, just to give us something to argue about, something to even be in awe of. You give it to us as an example. You give it to us so that we will not continue to go that way, but that we will recognize that our discontentment with you, our discontentment with your will and your plan and your provisions and your care of us can lead to disaster if not checked. It certainly did in Satan's existence. It did so for Adam and Eve and it does so in our lives and we have plenty of examples to prove it. Father, help us to find you to be our greatest treasure and pleasure in life. Help us to come to you recognizing that you are God. You are the creator. We are but the creature. And we are in desperate need of you. Thank you for your kindness and your mercy and your grace. And Lord, even though you chose not to redeem Satan and those fallen angels, I am so thankful that in your mercy and kindness you did choose to redeem us. Those who will come to you, broken by their sin, humbled, coming to Christ for life. In Jesus' name, amen.